Thank you everyone for joining us here this, today to showcase our faculty research grant recipients from 2022, presenting on the very fascinating and very diverse projects that they have done. And I'm very happy here to turn the floor over to Jennifer Williams to explain her project. And I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone again for coming today. My presentation is on Mary E. Hart, an active suffragette and temperance supporter and well-known newspaper woman in her time. The moniker of First Lady of Alaska was given to her by the Nome Nugget and by the Daily Alaska newspapers because of her work in boosting Alaska. Okay. The agenda today, just very briefly listed here, um, I will cover Mary's life and work, the research that is completed that was completed in 2022, a short analysis of the research process, and my 2023 research goals. Mary E. Hart was very involved in many organizations related to women's suffragette and the temperance movement, as well as writing for newspapers in California, such as the Los Angeles Herald and the San Francisco Call. She also wrote for the Nome Nugget in Nome, Alaska, the Alaska Yukon Magazine, and various other publications, and was the owner editor of the Pacific Monthly for a short time. But her most significant contribution was the manager of four World's Fair exhibits, one for California and three for Alaska. In this photograph from the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition, Mary is just to the right of the gentleman in the center of the photograph and that lovely hat. <laughs> this slide represents Mary's life in a nutshell. She represented California at the Women's Parliament and Women's Congress in 1890s, as uh, well as representing Alaska at the Louisiana Purchase Exposition in 1904, the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition in 1909, and the Panama Pacific Exposition in 1905. Although she was a part of major organizations and counted among her friends, well-known suffragists and activists, such as Jesse Benton Fremont, Clara Spalding Brown, Alice Moore McComas, Ina Coolbrith, and Phoebe Apperson Hurst, um, correspondence between them was very rare. Employment records and for the newspaper and for the Pacific Coast Steamship Company are not available as, mo as most of the organizations that she was involved in. Most of my research on Mary has been through newspaper archives. And this is just a short list of some of the events that happened in her lifetime that she was involved in. My first stop was California. This was a last minute addition to the research travel in May, 2022. The State Library and State Archives in Sacramento provided some information, but not as much as I anticipated once the research was completed. A trip to the Bay Area was ruled out at the same time due to the expense, but remote work has allowed additional resources to be located um, despite the very clunky online archives of California um, search engine. Uh, as those of you who do research, we know that, that sometimes our information is only as good as our search engine, so it takes time to learn it. Um, working relationships with very his historical museums and societies, as well as local libraries, have been very helpful to reveal little known sources about Mary's life and work. For example, the Corta Madera Library in Corta Madera, California, was able to find a photograph of Mary, who belonged to the Corta Madera Women's Improvement Club in 1908. That uh, source was not found anywhere else. Washington was the next stop. Uh, research in Seattle was completed in the special collections at University of Washington and the Puget Sound Historical Society, along with Dr. Vera Parham. 
Overall, we continued our general research into the early tourism industry of Southeast Alaska prior to 1940 and research into the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition of 1909 that took place in Seattle. Mary E. Hart was a part of boosting travel to Alaska, and I came across her during our first round of research in 2018. Additional remote work was completed prior to research travel in small collections owned by uh, the UW archives in May 20, prior to May 22, to maximize the research time with larger collections while in Seattle. Unfortunately, research travel to both Juneau and Skagway, Alaska was canceled due to a late requirement, um, a COVID vaccine requirement um, revealed by the then collections manager of Condite Gold Rush Historical National Park. This was very disappointing. I do need to get to Skagway at some point. Remote work continues with the Alaska State Archives and Library and through the University of Alaska Anchorage Consortium Library through the loan of microfilm. And the Consortium Library has been a very valuable resource. At some point, some of Mayor Hart's strong connections were with the Skagway community and research will need to be completed. Money was not requested in 2023 to return to Alaska due to other research priorities. Um, ongoing remote work continues as best as I can. The most robust information on Mary E. Hart and her connection with the two worlds with two worlds fairs came to the National Archives in College Park, Maryland. One small box contained correspondence between Mary E. Hart and the 30-some women's auxiliaries that were set up to gather domestic arts and education exhibits for the Louisiana Purchase Exposition, as well as the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. There were eight boxes of information related to the AYP which compromised a variety of letters between many individuals involved in the exposition as well as Mary. Um, as a side, the small box that contained only the information from Mary E. Hart is actually the only folder I have found with just her name on it. That's it. Um, and I'll explain that here in just a minute. <laughs> in the analysis where I'll, I'll talk about some of the, the challenges here, the analysis uh, uh, of my research in 2020, it was hit and miss. Some archival collections were rich with information such, such as the National Archives and details, as well as details, but other collections were not as forthcoming as I hoped. Given the clunky nature of the OAC, it will take some time to work through individual collections of some of her friends and acquaintances for correspondence and other details about her life. Because of the destruction of Mary's personal records in the 1906 San Francisco earthquake and the personal information of one of her close friends, Ina Coolbrith, there is little information on her early life through Coolbrith, for example, and their participation in the Pacific Coast Women's Press Association, for example, one of the many organizations she belonged to. The letters exchanged between her mother and her mother's cousin opened the door a bit more into Mary's life including a very vivid description um, that was preserved from one of Mary's letters about her survival uh, after the earthquake. Um, but it doesn't reveal a lot of information because only four of Mary's letters are included. Searches for Mary's husband, Frank H. Hart, prior to 1885 in Missouri newspapers, revealed small snippets of information before they left for California, but it's still not quite enough to trace their early life after their marriage in 1879. I'm still working on this part. Um, there were two major turning points that I found in Mary's life. Uh, the first one was that her removal from Missouri to Southern California. While Mary's mother states that, that Frank and Mary moved because of Frank's dissipated life in Missouri, it is also possible that Frank's work with the Postal Service allowed them to move to booming Southern California. Unfortunately, his Postal Service records are not extant according to the National Archives. This move would launch Mary's involvement in the suffragette movement in California and her involvement in other organizations that would allow her to take exhibits to the Chicago World's Fair for California in 1893. In Nome, Mary's newspaper writing career would mature with her coverage of the Nome Gold Rush, as well as her participation in the Nome Gold Rush, and her involvement in Alaska's first legal execution, a man named Fred Hardy. I presented on this portion of her life for the Ohio Academy of History in April of this year. 
Judge Wickersham was in known for a short time to deal with an attempt by Judge Alfred Nose and Alexander McKinsey to place mines in receivership to take the gold in a company formed by McKinsey. He was also the judge at Fred Hardy's murder trial in Unalaska in 1901. This is important because Mary's mine claims were part of this uh, conspiracy by McKinsey to profit from these mines by seizing them and forming his own company to mine them. Um, and then she would also meet Judge Wickersham and that may have provided an entree into Fred Hardy's jail cell to interview him. She would meet Presbyterian missionary and director of education for Alaska, Dr. Sheldon Jackson, who would recommend her as the lady manager for the Louisiana Purchase Exposition to Governor John Brady, also once a Presbyterian missionary. Her work would allow her to do the same for the AYP Exposition and become a guest lecturer for the Pacific Coast Steamship Company on their Alaska excursion boats and create an Alaska exhibit at the Panama Pacific International Exposition in 1905. Um, as a side, Mary's personal correspondence, research notes for two books and diaries and journals were destroyed in 1911 at the sinking in the sinking of the SS Spokane while on that Alaska excursion route. So there were several points in her life um, where a lot of her personal notes and research were completely destroyed. So that's one of the reasons it's very difficult to try to find her. Um, in 2023, travel to the Presbyterian Historical Society proved uh, useful to locate information about the relationship between Mary, Dr. Sheldon Jackson, and Governor John Brady. Additional records cannot be accessed through microfilm because Gale Primary Sources owns the rights to the microfilm since the sources are available through their online archival database, and APIS does not subscribe to that comprehensive database. Additional travel to St. Louis and Jefferson City for research um, in August of this year at the Missouri Historical Society, Missouri State Archives, the St. Louis City Library and other facilities should reveal additional information about the Louisiana Purchase Exposition. A brief research trip to the Field Museum in Chicago will focus on their Alaska collections on the way to St. Louis. Because of the fragmented nature of sources directly and indirectly related to Mary's life, research will continue during the writing process. I mentioned here um, this one publication, The Gold Fields. This was the first publication that was jammed into this folder at the National Archives with Mary's name on it. And it was so folded up, um, I had to actually have a professional conservator go back, unfold it carefully and take better photographs for me um, because it was so folded and so fragile and so brittle. So far, I've not been able to find a second copy of this. There are other publications with this name, but they're not the same publication. And it's, uh, very important because she wrote a lot of the articles um, in this publication. So these are my 2023 research goals, as stated previously. Again, I presented at the Fred Hardy um, on the Fred Hardy execution at the 2023 Ohio Academy of History. It was very re well received, and I continue to look for opportunities in order to present my conferences at conferences about this ongoing research. I do have plans to produce a book length manuscript. I hope. Um, it's a lot of fragmentation, so I'm hoping that I can get it together and put it into a nice one nice comprehensive volume. And I thank you very much. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much. What a fascinating, uh, very circuitous puzzle you have going on. <laughs> <laughs> she was, uh, um, she was a very unique individual um, that I keep saying that, but she, she really was, um, she was very adventurous. Um, she was one of these women in this group of these few women that I mentioned um, that was in this uh, new woman on the cusp of this, what was referred to as the new woman, um, both domestic and, and working and um, making entries into areas that women normally did not. She actually, in an article that I found yesterday, she actually complains a little bit about um, being, a, being women being assigned only society pages and what have you and, and not being able to write on other topics, although this was changing. Um, and there's a couple other women that I found in her circle that have echoed this who were journalists. Um, so it's, it's sort of this fascinating transition, not only of 
these women in the post-Civil War era moving into the progressive era of the 20th century, um, but also just her life in general. She witnessed so many events. She survived the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918. You know, so she witnessed all these major events um, in her lifetime, which also makes her interesting. Oh, thank you, Renee. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, it's I'm 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 very amazed at how much she contributed. Um, this started out as um, as uh, Vera and I were doing research, and we we have a book chapter coming out in January on our original research project um, on the tourism trade in Southeast Alaska from 1870-1940. And I focus a lot on material culture because part of my background training is in archaeology, and I've done archaeology in Alaska. And so in 2007, when I was out there doing archaeology, I said, you know, what about the curios? Why do people buy stuff? Why do they come here? And so I started looking into the curio trade, and it's absolutely fascinating. Um, particularly in the late 19th century as Victorian travelers and museum professionals vied for these authentic collections, as they were called. Um, thank you. It's my dining room. <laughs> um, and speaking of Victorian, I have a Victorian house. Um, and so there was a, a, a massive push to gather up authentic or ethnographic items, as we would call them today, that were used within the context of these, of the Clinket and the Haida um, and the Simshian, which are the main um, Alaska tribes. Um, and so uh, there was a lot of advice out there about how to get baskets, which were, everybody went through this basket craze. Um, and, and one advice said, go, go after berry picking season and ask them for their baskets, ask the women for their baskets. And there's very, uh, very unique distinction between an ethnographic item and an item made for the trade. Um, my argument though, was that um, either way, despite the fact that divorce from the culture that these curios have, they didn't have any use within the culture themselves, unlike a mask or a berry basket or a basket used to boil potatoes, um, they still represented that culture. Um, they were still made by an artisan or a craftsman. Um, and Mary had her own collections as well. Her collections were on display at the Panpac International Exposition in 1915, as well as in 1904 and 1909. So she took part in this too. She was a huge booster for Alaska travel. Just an amazing woman, almost like a one woman boosting organization. <laughs> Anyone else? Any other questions I could uh, answer for you? My presentation was um, a little short, so let me know. I have a question. Um, this, is, this is Christy. Hi, how are you? Um, I was just uh, drawn to something on your last slide mm -hmm. about. Um, I don't know if it's a if we if you can say a few words about about that. What uh, what sort of trip are you doing? Oh, I um, offer a study tour. It's geared toward undergraduate and graduate students, but I only have taken um, adults on the trip, um, and it focuses on a lot of different aspects. We go to Sitka, Juno, Haynes, Skagway. This planned anyway. Petersburg, Wrangell, and Ketchikan. And what I try to do is to get people to understand Alaska is more than just what you see on a cruise ship. Uh, don't get me wrong. Cruise ships are wonderful for individuals who have limited means and limited time. They do give you a sense of what Alaska is like, but this trip is sort of geared toward getting out and getting away and going to see these places. And I do a lot of discussion on uh, you know, in place. So you get me occasionally doing a little lecture, like on the on the Battle of Sitka in 1802 and 1804. Who's heard of that? Um, we go for hikes. We go for walks. Um, we go out at sunset, sometimes at 10 or 1030 at night and go out to the Mendenhall Glacier or, you know, we, we go out and, and experience a little bit more of Alaska beyond just what the cruise ships do. And there's readings that I ask people to do uh, just so that you have a base of information to operate from. And I can give you more information if you want to email me. Yeah, um, what's your email? That sounds great. Um, it's jennifer.williams7. Okay, thank you. At my campus. 
-hmm. Yeah. Um, Renee, to your question, do those artifacts still, artifacts still exist? Yes. The Field Museum was built on those artifacts, um, as well as the University of Pennsylvania Museum. Um, Lewis Shotridge uh, was a um, Kluquan Clinkett. Um, he and his wife Florence were collectors for the museum, essentially, and helped to bring artifacts to um, um, to the public to to the museum so that they could purchase them and, and place them in the museums. He also carved a miniature longhouse for the 1904 Louisiana Purchase Expositions and still sort of chasing that theme down a little bit. Um, there's uh, trying to chase down more photographs than just what was sort of the official photographs taken. Um, so yeah, those artifacts still do exist in many collections. The um, a couple of years ago, I was able to do some work in, in the collections at the Alaska State Museum. Um, their curator at the time was able to let me into the collections and I did three days of photography work in all their collections. And it's absolutely fascinating um, what they found. And I presented on that at the Ohio Academy of History last year. So that was really a, a lot of fun. Everybody, you know, Everybody wants to know where those artifacts are. And they're in several, there are many places around the country focused in Alaska, but many places around the country. So they're, so you can go visit them. <laughs> well, thank you. Those are great questions and such fascinating research. It's been, you know, great to see a couple of presentations here that involved different kinds of archival research and different experiences trying to find things and I love that idea of you know the, the one little box that actually has her name on it and trying to not never being quite sure what you're going to find when you open one of those boxes exactly and I had to wait um two years because of COVID closures to get to that box so it just every time I would log into the National Archives I would see my list sitting there and I'm like mm, okay be patient <laughs> It was it was well worth the wait. I mean, I think I copied every single piece of paper, even if it was a bill of lading. I think I copied every single piece of paper from that from that box. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for you and everyone who has joined us here. Uh, it's been a wonderful afternoon of hearing about very different projects, but such wonderful work. Uh, so thank you all for being here and. Um, you may, you may be able to jump back to room B for a few minutes if you want, but I will uh, let you enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you so much to all of our presenters who are here for your hard work. And I'm looking forward to hearing about your next projects. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>